Thanks everyone for having me here. My name is Daniel. I uh, am a SCAR developer and teacher. I founded this learning platform called Rock the JVM. How many of you have heard of Rock the JVM? Raise your hands. Oh my god, this is the sweetest thing that I've seen all day. <laughs> awesome, amazing. Uh, so, you probably know a little bit about me. I teach Scala and I try to cover pretty much everything in the Scala ecosystem, including functional programming libraries, functional programming itself in the plain language, uh, how to prep for interviews, Aka, Cat's Effect. I try to do some stuff for data engineers as well, Spark, Flink, and all that sort of stuff. So, if you haven't checked out Rocket JVM, please do. I'm, I see that most of you already uh, have checked it out. So, this will probably make a bit of my talk half redundant, but I hope the folks that are watching us through streaming or YouTube will probably uh, have some new stuff to learn. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to show you a little bit of a Cat's Effect cancellation. How many of you are using Cat's Effect? Alright, so I have one. Okay, got it. Uh, so, for, uh, for those of you who said that you're using Cat's Effect, uh, this talk might be a little bit more of a refresher, or maybe you'll get the chance to click some of these concepts back into your existing knowledge. Uh, I'm, what, I'm gonna walk you through the fundamentals of Cat's Effect, why we, why we need it, how to use it, and then talk a little bit about concurrency and multi-threading in Cat's Effect, as well as some cancellation primitives that Cat's Effect has to offer. Now, I'm gonna go a bit unorthodox with this, with this talk, because I'm not gonna talk with slides, but I'm going to do some live coding, and I have here some uh, empty, uh, some blank space that I hope I'm gonna fill with um, what I'm gonna show you today. So, um, let's see how it goes, and uh, then we can talk and answer questions. By the way, I have stickers here after we, um, after we end up discussing, so uh, after we end up talking, come grab one and let's have a chat. All right, cool. Uh, so, um, the objective of this talk, we'll, we'll assume that you know some fundamentals about Cat's Effect. Um, most of you raised your hand, so you, you know, I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about here. So, uh, I'm going to walk you through what the IO monad is and why we use it. And we're also going to use some of the concepts in the Cat's library as a bonus, but not necessarily that much, just so that we can use some transformations and uh, niceties here in, uh, in, the, in the code that I'm going to show you. And I'm going to walk you through some fibers, cancellations, synchronously, asynchronously, and then some really, really powerful pinpoint cancellation primitives in Cat's effect. If uh, uh, if you already know this one, well, um, it's worth a refresher anyway. So, here's the thing. Um, in Cat's Effect, we think about code in terms of these data structures called IOs. And these IOs are simple data structures that represent any sort of computation. So, if I define a small value, it's called this meaning of life, I'd love to start with this one. Uh, meaning of life. Uh, as an IO with, let's say, a value of 42, uh, because of course we know what the meaning of life is. And uh, this is a simple data structure that will take an expression by name that, and will evaluate it at some point when we force the evaluation of the IO. Now, at this point, nothing gets executed, nothing gets evaluated. And so we would have to evaluate this IO in what we call the end of the world. So in this object that I call Scott in the city, I'm going to extend a, a special uh, type in the cast effect called IO app, and I'm going to use IO app dot simple because I don't want to get too fancy with this. And uh, IO app dot simple has a different kind of main method that's called run, and I'm going to override run, which, as you notice, it returns an IO of some expression that returns a unit. And uh, if you want to uh, do something here, you would have to evaluate an IO and then return something that does something, which is the unit type. Now, in this case, the IO42 is an IO int. This is not really that, um, let's say, spectacular. So I'm going to add a little uh, extension method to the IO data type. I'm going to write Scala2 because my uh, ID before this training had some hiccups on me. So I'm going to use Scala2, but I'm going to show you what you can do if you write Scala3. So I'm going to write this implicit class. I'm going to call this debug or something that takes a simple type argument A and wraps an IO as an IO of that particular type. And I'm going to decorate every IO with a method called debug, which 
uh, returns another I of A. And these IOs, because they're data structures, they're not necessarily anything fancy, they resemble the kind of data structures that you've probably used elsewhere, like lists, options, tries, futures, and that sort of stuff. We also have these kind of transformations like map, flat map, four comprehensions, and that sort of stuff. So I can simply say something like IO map, and considering the value that this contains inside, I'm going to uh, run a print line, and I'm, I like to uh, run this little tag where I'm going to print the thread name. So I'm going to say thread current thread get name, and the value that this IO would have evaluated if I called this evaluation method and return the same value. Now, when I say io.map, what I'm actually doing is I'm running a transformation on a data structure and obtaining a new data structure as a result. So our programs in Cat's Effect are basically a single data structure, single IO that might contain zillions of transformations. And when we evaluate that, that whole IO chain gets, gets, uh, gets to be evaluated. And those IOs may uh, perform pretty much anything. They may run a server, they may put some data somewhere, they may scrape the whole internet, they may uh, fetch some data from the database, and we have, uh, uh, we have libraries such as FS2 that I understand you guys at ClearScore are using. So any kind of computation that I.O. can perform. So our program as a functional programmer is a single I.O. that might basically start up the world. And in our case, if I want to uh, print this meaning of life, I would say meaning of life debug, and then this will basically print when evaluated, and then I'm going to call void to discard the value. So right now I can run this application, I'm going to print the absolute meaning of life, which will end this talk, which is for you. Okay. Cool. Amazing. So these IOs uh, are essentially what we are, we're dealing with in Cat's Effect, and uh, uh, we have all these uh, transformations. And uh, forgive my, my comments here, I tend to do these sort of comments in my courses and my training sessions because I want people to get the code and play with it and uh, remember the sort of stuff that I, that I discuss here, so uh, I'm not going to give up on this reflex. So we have this, uh, these sort of transformations like map, flat map, and so on. Uh, I can define something like uh, double meaning of life, I'm going to say double MOL, as meaning of life map underscore times two, and this will be another IO type. So we can do all sorts of transformations like, you, uh, like you're probably well aware. Now, Cat's Effect is all about managing uh, transformations in any sort of way. So IO is an abstraction that can simulate any kind of computation. This is why it's so powerful. And Cat's Effect is also about concurrency. So concurrency means that you can evaluate multiple effects on different JVM threads at the same time. However, Cat's Effect has a different kind of abstraction, not directly mapped to an exact JVM thread, but Cat's Effect has this notion of a fiber, which is pretty much a quote unquote, I like to call this a logical thread. And uh, uh, a logical thread basically means a chain of effects, a chain of these IOs that will be evaluated by some thread managed by Cat's Effect. And so the fiber has the same logical equivalence to a JVM thread, however, Unlike a thread which is a, an active entity that consumes CPU power and uh, ha is allocated by the operating system, fibers are passive, meaning that they're plain data structures that you can spawn and kill or mark as deleted as many as you like. So in a regular JVM application, we tend to think of parallelism as the number of threads allocated per JVM, which pretty much means the number of threads that a single CPU core can allocate. So the metric is number of threads per CPU core. This is, this is the kind of parallelism that you can offer uh, in a normal JVM application. But in Cat's Effect, we tend to think the metric becomes number of fibers per giga heap. So notice that the metric changed in terms of memory. And fibers are very, very lightweight data structures. So you can spawn like millions of uh, fibers per giga heap and still have a massively parallel applications, uh, a parallel application on top of just a hundred or a few hundred JVM threads. So this abstraction is really powerful because it detaches completely the concept of parallelism, which is what we want to think in terms of, and the JVM threads, which is the native parallelism of the computer that the application runs on top of. Any questions so far? I've been talking a lot. All right. Cool. So. Uh, these fibers can be uh, created as an effect, so I can say uh, a fiber, 
as, uh, I don't know, double demo L dot start. And this method start creates another kind of effect whose return time is pretty complex. We don't necessarily um, use these elements directly. So this will be an IO of, and the type is called fiber that I'm going to import. And fiber has an effect type, which is another IO. Uh, the can, the uh, failure mode is throwable, and the value mode is, uh, in this case, int. So this is what this type means. We're uh, creating another effect that, when evaluated, will create this data structure that will be then scheduled by the cat's effect runtime. So these fibers are passive and allocated or scheduled uh, by the cat's effect runtime. So cat's effect manages a, just a few threads, and with those few threads, you can schedule millions of fibers. So fibers are really, really cheap. So, um, if you want to run concurrency or concurrent computations, uh, you can run four comprehensions because IOs are uh, monadic data structures, so you can run map, flat map, and that sort of stuff, and so you can run four comprehensions. And because creation of a fiber is also an, uh, an effect, which is an IO, I can create something like uh, uh, a, let's call this concurrency, concurrent uh, computation, as a four comprehension. And uh, I'm going to call this fiber A as, uh, and I can use um, a, a chain of uh, IO data structures like IO, I don't know, maybe uh, first computation, first computation, uh, and then I can use this uh, arrow, arrow like operator, which is pretty much a flat map with the, the other IO as an argument. And then I can say IO.sleep for uh, maybe one second. And uh, if in order to import the second method, I need to run an import for Scala concurrent duration everything. I've done this uh, more times than I can count. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, return some value, like IO 100 or something like that. And I can call start. So this will create an IO. And when you run a for comprehension, this is the fiber itself when inside the for comprehension. And uh, inside the, the uh, for comprehension, you can do Fib a, fib a dot join for instance, and I'm going to yield something like unit because I want my ID to help me here. And you can start as many fibers as you like because fibers, as I mentioned, are very cheap data structures. So I'm going to say fib b uh, in uh, I know uh, maybe I can run a second computation, and then I'm going to sleep for like two seconds, and I'm going to return some other value. And I'm going to join both fibers, like fit B dot join, and I'm going to yield unit. So this will be an IO unit in this case. So look at this code. This resembles pretty much imperative programming. So if you, if it weren't Scala, this would have been any kind of imperative language, maybe job. Like first time, let this be a string, then sleep one second and let and return a hundred. The second computation is let this be a string and then um, two seconds sleep and then return a, a different value. Join fiber A, join fiber B. Just basically start two new threads. So this is the equivalent of imperative programming. This is the magic of cat's effect in the IO data type because this is a, a, an exceptional bridge between pure functional programming in terms of immutable data types, map, flat map, monads, and functors. So pretty much this is the crux of 95% of what we do. And imperative programming because if you look at the highlighted code, this looks like one thing after another. So uh, we're doing pretty much imperative programming while still keeping the pure functional mindset intact. So if I run this uh, application as uh, the concurrent computation here in, uh, in main, we're going to see that these two computations start at the same time, but I'm not going to, uh, I, I did not do the debug thing, so I'm going to add the debug because I forgot about it. Uh, and then I'm going to call a debug here and debug in the other place. Cool, let's run this again. So notice that they start at the same time and uh, obviously they, they have their own life cycle. So we have first computation, second computation, and so on and so forth. Now, the thread handle here that I've added in the debug is not made by accident because I wanted to show you that even though these three these computations start and run at the same time, each piece runs on a different thread. So the piece, first computation, runs on thread number eight, the second piece runs on thread number zero. 
So even though we have the same logical sequence, the same logical thread, so to speak, the pieces of the computation itself run on different threads because it's the job of the cast effect runtime to do the scheduling. That's not our concern and it's not something that uh, we need to think about. So cast effect has this smart scheduler that can even reschedule bits of, com of computations while keeping the logical sequence intact. Okay, so we have this notion of a uh, of fiber, and the powerful thing about uh, cat's effect is that we can not only start computations on fibers, but we can also cancel them. Because without this tool, once you start a computation, there's no way to end it. And there are many situations when you would like to end computations. Maybe you click a cancel button in your UI and you want to actually cancel that computation. If that I.O start scraping the entire internet and you can't cancel that, what do you do? Do you plug, do you plug it up? You can't. So, uh, Cat's Effect offers us this capability to cancel computations. So, this is what I'm going to talk about next. Am I talking too fast or too slow? Give me some feedback here. All good? Okay. All right. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, cancellation is this capability of Cat's Effect to insert a signal in the I.O. chain to stop the computation at that point. And once it's stopped, obviously the, the rest of the computation does not go through. Now, you can cancel computations either synchronously, uh, assuming I can spe spell synchronously properly, um, you can say, uh, let's call this a sync canceled uh, computation. Um, I can do something like uh, IO, um, maybe uh, something that needs to cancel, and then I'm going to say I/O sleep uh, for one second, and then I'm going to inject something that's called I/O canceled, and then an I/O with uh, this should never print. And then I'm going to add a debug to all of these, so debug and then debug, and in main I'm going to call a sync computation dot void to discard the value so that I uh, match the return type required by run. So I'm going to uh, say something that needs to cancel and notice that the other effect which is at the very end is not run because this IO cancelled signal was injected by me in this case in the IO chain and therefore no further IOs are being evaluated. So you can cancel them synchronously but the most powerful thing of course is cancel them asynchronously. And in the cancellation asynchronously, uh, you can run uh, two different bits of computations, and you can cancel them um, uh, by calling the cancel method on a fiber. So I can, uh, for instance, shamelessly copy this uh, double chain, this double for comprehension, and I'm going to call this let's call this half canceled as uh, a for comprehension. I'm going to copy that, and uh, I'm going to paste it here. So first computation. One takes one second, one takes two seconds, I don't care. Let's say I want to cancel the second computation. So I'm going to say uh, underscore in, uh, let's say, io uh, dot sleep for one second, maybe uh, 1500 millis, something. Uh, and then I'm going to call um, fibb dot canceled, fibb dot cancel. And in between, I'm going to print something so that I know what, a, uh, what the application is doing. So canceling a second computation. All right. And then I'm going to call fib.cancel. Obviously, I'm going to do a debug here. So let's say IO starting the canceler. That's a word. Um, and then I'm going to run this. And this whole thing, I'm going to start on another file. So I'm going to call start here. Notice that this fiber C is a new fiber. I might, well, I might not wait for it to join because fibers are very cheap. I can start them at a moment's notice without needing to actually care if uh, the fiber is ever released. Now, granted, if the fiber actually uses some very um, critical resources, you need to handle those. But let's say for, uh, for the purpose of this uh, demonstration that I'm not going to 
do that. So I'm going to call have cancelled that void. It's already an I/O unit. I don't, I don't need to call void on that. And uh, notice that we we have the first computation and second computation started pretty much at the same time. Starting the canceller started at uh, the same starting point, and then just the first computation returned the result, but the second computation did not. So with fib.cancel, which is where we have it here, with fib.cancel, you can cancel an uh, an asynchronous computation, which is a, a, a logical fiber that's being scheduled by the cast effect runtime, and you can cancel it while it's running, while it's running on another thread, not just by manually injecting io.cancel here, which almost never happens. This is just me demonstrating the, the synchronous cancellation. So canceling a fiber is one of the most powerful things that you can do because while a computation is happening, you might uh, change your circumstances or the, the application itself might change in the meantime, which makes your computation irrelevant and you might want to save resources or you might want to save some damage. Uh, if the, that computation is particularly dangerous. So cancellation is not only powerful, but it's also necessary in, su in such a case. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah. So from the FIB perspective, do you get some kind of signal uh, that yes. you're getting cancelled, so that maybe you want to do some, something before you die? Yes. There is something that's called on cancel, and you can pass an IO here, like IO, uh, I've been canceled. And uh, I'm going to do a debug here. So if I run this this uh, listener that IO, I've been canceled, what am I doing here? Uh, I need a void here. Um, in the case of cancellation, it's often a good idea to release resources, for instance, which is. Uh, pretty legit. So notice that it says I've been cancelled here. Right? So you can add listeners for when you're cancelled so that you can release resources or uh, somehow clean the state of your application if that's, if that's the case. Any other questions? Alright, if there are no questions, I'm going to talk about one of the most powerful features in Cat's Effect. It's called uncancelable. Uh, so while cancellation, or the ability to cancel an effect is powerful and necessary as we've, we've just shown, there's also the need to prevent an application or an effect from being canceled by someone else. So if I start, for instance, a payment to some payment provider, like uh, maybe ClearScore wants to analyze my credit score, I'm, I don't really want to cancel that process. Once it's started, I, I don't want to interfere along the way. So uh, Cat's Effect offers this API or this possibility to prevent an item or an IO chain from ever being cancelled. And that, that is called uncancelable. So, for instance, I'm going to assume that we have an online store because we, we, we've all dealt with that. Maybe we want to click some items, add them to the cart, proceed, check out, and then start payment. And you fill in your credit card details. And when you click that button, once. Sorry about that. Uh, when you click that button, you don't want to pop like this microphone. We want the payment to go through, and you would like to have either an error state, which is um, something went wrong with the credit card, or the money was taken uh, from your bank account and the order started. So there's, there has to be a complete finality to it. It has to be a transactional process. So this is what this uncancelable does. So let's, uh, let me create a, a small method that's called as process payment. That uh, it might take an argument or uh, several arguments in real life and I'm going to return an IO unit. And in this case, I'm just going to implement that like uh, IO.sleep. So I'm going to sleep for one second and I'm going to consider the, uh, the, the process complete. Now, I'm going to uh, create a special payment system. So payment flow as a for comprehension, so I'm going to uh, run uh, a for that says something along the lines of uh, IO uh, starting payment, starting payment. Uh, so the loading, the, the screen changes in your online store, like processing payment, and then you get this loading spinner, so I'm going to say debug, and then I'm going to start actually processing the thing, so process payment. 
And then I'm going to issue an IO with a, a payment complete. And I'm going to go debug. And finally, I'm going to yield a unit. So we have everything cool. Now, in this initial payment flow, if I spin it up on a fiber and halfway through I, uh, I send a cancellation signal, look what happens. So I'm going to say um, cancellation of doom. And I'm going to run a for comprehension. I'm going to run a fiber. So I'm going to say fib in uh, special payment flow dot start. And then I'm going to run a malicious uh, thread. So I'm going to run an IO. Uh, I will cancel this poor fella. And then I'm going to say IO sleep uh, for half a second, so it's 500 millis. Let me add the debug so that we can actually see the thing on the, on the console. And then I'm going to run fib.cancel. And I'm going to uh, wait for the fiber to join, so fib, fib join. And I'm going to yield unit as before. Okay, I'm going to just start. All right. And then I'm going to use this cancellation of doom. I'm not going to call it wait because I don't need it. And notice that my special payment flow did not complete my payment. It may or may not take my money. It may, if it did not take my money, maybe it actually started the order. Maybe I can buy that order again and, and enter the cancellation. I might be a little malicious on this one. So we want to protect this special payment flow from ever being canceled by a malicious threat or by a clumsy threat uh, for that matter. So I'm going to create something like uh, unbreakable flow. And I'm going to use io.uncancelable, which takes a Kind of a weird API. Uh, it takes a pull IO to an IO in effect. I'm going to describe what that is. And uh, after that, I'm going to uh, end the talk and then we can start the, the actual conversation. And I'm going to use that special payments flow here in my Lambda. And this unbreakable flow I'm going to use in this cancellation of do. So I'm going to try to run this. And notice that the payment was completed, even though the cancellation was sent, but it was ignored. So uncancelable protects an IO chain from ever being canceled from another thread. This is very, very powerful, but that's not all. I'm gonna go this, I'm gonna go full marketing on this one, but wait, that's not all. Because uncancelable has such a powerful API that you can pinpoint select. If you ever want a piece of your IO chain to be cancelable, and a piece of IO to be not cancelable, maybe you have a complex flow, maybe you're doing an authentication service where the user starts to enter their password, maybe they've entered their username and then click enter, and then you invite them to type their password. If they take a million years to type the password, you want to reset them to, to where they were. But once they type the password and they hit enter, the validation itself should not be cancelable. So, I'm going to demonstrate something like that. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna create um, something that's... Um, uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to run some offload. So, I'm going to say input password. I'm going to type it. So, I'm going to uh, run a for comprehension. I'm going to say um, an IO, say, please type your password or uh, type your password. And then I'm going to say debug. Then I'm going to say IO uh, typing, which is the actual user. I'm going to I'm going to simulate that the actual the user that is actually doing that. And then I'm going to sleep for a bit. So I'm going to sleep for two seconds. Maybe maybe you're faster at typing your passwords, but this fictitious user is not. And then I'm going to return an IO with the ultimate password, which is rock the JVM one exclamation mark of course. And then I'm going to yield that password, so I'm going to uh, use that one, so pass, and the password is then returned. So this is a, a, an IO string. Now, I'm going to run the authentication flow, so all flow, as another for comprehension, which is to say that the, um, the uh, input password is being fetched, and then I'm going to uh, run something like this. Um, I'm going to say, 
um, password in uh, input password. And then I'm going to run a validation. So I'm going to say uh, IO uh, validating password. So this is the loading spinner once you hit enter in your, uh, in your um, sign in page. And then maybe you want to sleep for a bit, which is the server taking, taking sweet time. So sleep for one second. And then you're going to return. So I'm going to yield. Pass must be equal to uh, the Rock the JVM1. So Rock the JVM1 exclamation mark, which is the ultimate password number to be conceived by mankind. OK, um, cool. Now, this is all well and good, but in this whole flow, the input, uh, the input phase, the input password, I want this to be cancelable because if the user takes a million years to type in their password, I want to reset them back to the sign-in page or to the home page. But the validation bit, I want this to not be cancelable. So I'm going to wrap this in io.cancelable. And I'm going to wrap this in the following structure. Uh, io.uncancelable takes a lambda, as uh, I've seriously neglected before, um, this lambda takes an argument in the form of a pole. A pole is a data structure that, will, that is able to mark bits of your computation as cancelable. So I can say this pole is the argument. And I'm going to wrap this input password in the pole. So I'm going to say pole invoked on this input password, which means that this is cancelable. The whole, the whole flow, the whole authentication flow is uncancelable except for that. And you can use this poll as many times as you like, and uh, you will essentially carve out pieces of your uncancelable thing that will be cancelable. So I'm going to run the following flow, the, the following test. So I'm going to, let's call this kickout user. As a for comprehension, I'm going to start this off flow in a fiber, so I'm going to say, um, let's call this fib as offflow.start. And then I'm going to try to cancel this poor fellow. So I'm going to say IO canceling. Let's sleep a bit. So I'm going to say IO sleep for, what am I doing? Uh, I'm doing two seconds. Let's sleep for one second. One second. And then I'm going to say IO canceling debug. And then I'm going to say fib cancel. And uh, this is also in another fiber, so I'm going to do start on that. And I'm going to yield unit. And this kickout user, I'm going to use in main. Test it out. So type your password, typing, and then after one second, the poor user is kicked out. But if I sleep for too long, maybe uh, 2,500 uh, millis, which is two and a half seconds, so halfway through the validation stage, what am I doing? You need a debug on 74? Uh, debug on 74? Yes. Uh, God damn. Um, I've been speaking a lot. All right. You need to join. Uh, I do need to join, yes. I need to join the fiber because otherwise the application will finish before the fifth instance can end. All right. Um, the validating password, but I need to also print the validation complete. Let's say, uh, welcome user. Just to verify this. So validating, canceling, welcome user. So even though we sent the cancellation signal halfway through the validation stage, which was supposed to be uncancelable, the user was welcome. And this is probably the most powerful thing to land in Cast Effect, because you can have this extreme control over which bits of your code are cancelable and which are not. That is it, folks. Thank you so much. I hope this makes sense. Any questions? Um, um, what happens when uh, to the thread that you're doing the cancelling with when it's uncancelable? 
It's simply descaled. So the, fit, the fiber itself can stay, can stay loose. Uh, so the, 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 data, the fiber is just a pure data structure. It, it doesn't occupy much memory space. You can have that on cancel thing that I showed you uh, like 15 minutes ago, where you can free up resources in case you're canceled, which is, which is good practice to do. Uh, but otherwise, the thread itself can, the thread, the JVM thread, can free, feel free to uh, allocate something else, to schedule something else. Cool. I think you more as well, like, like error handling on, on how do you know that it's not being cancelled? Like, is there any way to know that? Yes, there are error handlers in both fibers and the effects themselves. Yeah. How would you write tests for this kind of application? Uh, Testing is a little bit difficult, uh, I have to admit. Um, I don't have a straight answer for this one. It, it varies a lot because the flows, uh, the flows that you, in, you end up implementing in real life are very, very different. Um, the way that I would do that is I would evaluate these effects. So uh, we would write, we would reduce the flow to a minimum of IO chains and then evaluate that and uh, test the values that we, that we obtain from those, from those IOs. So with plain Scala test and that sort of thing. Thank you. In other questions, I will assume like if uh, you are running some long computation inside IO, it uh, won't be cancelled. Um, it, uh, what do you mean? Uh, imagine I'm calling a database, uh, uh -huh. some library which is not using IO. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are calling cancel, but it will be like it will take ten seconds, so it will run for ten seconds and. Cancel. It depends on how that thing is written. Yeah. So if uh, if that I/O um, is written to be uh, blocking, yeah. then it might not necessarily be cancelable. It depends. It depends on the kind of interaction that you have with the database. But most of the time, and this would would be preferable, of course. Uh, would be to cancel that that interaction because I'm pretty sure that there are, are uh, mechanisms in place for, for doing that. I don't know the Doobie framework all that all, all that much. I mean, uh, I know it at the surface, but I don't know if, uh, internally how you can manage cancellations if you have this sort of stuff, this sort of stuff. So Doobie is uh, the the library that plugs in the cats effect the best. Um, yeah, so, so looking at your example where you have uh, an IO uncancelable, uh, it's still value-rates to an IO, um, I guess what my question is, is there any way to sort of embed in the type system that an IO is uncancelable? Uh, because if you have, let's say, a method somewhere else that returns an uncancelable IO, and you try and call cancel on it somewhere else, it's not going to behave as you would expect it to behave. So you're, uh, you're asking whether you can tell the compiler to, to to prevent you from calling cancel on something? Yes. Um, I would approach that in a different way, in the sense that uh, cat's effect has this type class called monad cancel, which offers the capability of something to cancel or be uncancelable. And monad cancel is this type class that you can implement for any effect type, which for IO is obviously implemented in the cat's effect runtime itself. But you can uh, you can implement the monad cancel uh, type class for any kind of effect system. Maybe you, you want to use options or uh, monad transformers, eithers, that sort of stuff. You can implement that, and uh, you offer in the type system, as you mentioned, the ability to cancel or not. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, what happens if our effect uh, does not complete this success? Uh, what if it's cancelled and failed at the same time? Will we what callbacks will be visited? You can you can process the outcome of fiber. So when you do fiber.join, uh, the value obtained by uh, fiber.join is an outcome, which is to say the status of the fiber at its termination phase. It might complete with a success, a failure, which is uh, usually a throwable, or the cancellation. So you can tell how that fiber ended, either in a successful value or uh, an error, uh, which is not necessarily caused by cancellation, or with a cancel state. So you can listen for that and uh, process it. 
Okay, and uh, like let's say that was a database transaction building and uh, it failed for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it raised an error, but yep. it was a long transaction, 10 seconds. And within the 10 seconds, we received a signal, uh, a thread, uh, is it? Uh, so we got the cancellation signal. So uh, is it going to be cancelled? Cancelled, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the outcome of the firewall is saying cancel. You can, you can run a, a simple pattern match on the uh, on the on the fiber outcome itself, and you can uh, you can figure out whether it was cancelled or errored or successful. And in the cancel state, you can you can run different logic if that's of interest. And is there any way to if I want the error, even even though it was cancelled, but I still want to handle the error, uh, can I do it somehow? Uh, you won't. So uh, they're disjoint. Outcomes. Either you're cancelled or you're errored. These, these do not overlap. Any more questions? All right. Well, in that case, you can check out uh, my website at rockajvm.com. I teach this sort of stuff uh, to folks all, all around the world and in companies. And uh, if you want to write to me about this talk, or if you have any questions, or anything that I can help with, you can write to me at daniel at and I'll be more than happy to help. Thank you so much. Oops.